You are listening to the Game Light Training Podcast, where we talk about golf practice, golf learning, golf psychology, the PGA Tour, college golf, and all things golf. On this show, we're going to be sharing thoughts, different beliefs, different strategies, all with the one goal of helping golf coaches teach better or golfers play better. I'm your host, Matthew Cook, and today's a pretty cool show. I'm just on my own, but what I do have is our GLT partner in Denmark, Mark Molling, Mollen, on the line. How's it going, Mark? Thanks for your time, and thanks for joining us today. I'm very good, Matthew. Thank you for inviting me on. No problem. And we also have a very special guest, Edward Cullen. I'm, I'm hoping I pronounced that right, Ed. <laughs> Um, good. Good to nailed it. Uh, Ed is a practice coach and is from a company called Skill Acquisition. I'm sure a lot of our listeners have seen it out there or heard about it. Um, thanks for joining us, guys. I guess to start, it would be a good idea to introduce yourselves and, and sort of what you do and, and maybe a little bit about why you do it. Um, Mark, do you want to go first? Yeah, let me uh, let me start with that. Uh, I will do my very best. Um, <laughs> I'm working a lot with junior development, and I guess to explain why I do what I do, uh, it's good to think where I come from. And uh, my childhood was a lot about sports, um, and. Uh, it was always it was a natural thing that there was either a win or a loss, and that was just a part of the game. Um, it was my dad that did a lot of the sports with me, and uh, one one story that can describe why I have my coaching values as I have now is that uh, I was asking him with with a few tears in my eyes why I always lose the game. And uh, and he just answered me, it's because I'm better than you right now, but one day you'll be better than me. But, and then the most important sentence I got from my dad, I think in, in my entire life, was that, but I really love to spend this time with you. And I think that sentence makes a big, big difference in the way I'm coaching. And uh, it was just natural that even though I was losing, it didn't influence the quality of the experience in playing the game I was playing. Uh, and that's actually how I set up my coaching now. That's what I want the juniors to experience. Cool. Uh, in, in their life as well, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. And uh, Ed, you are, you are a practice coach, so please go and uh, tell us all about it. Yeah, I'm not sure how I can follow that. I, I, I kind of... Uh, tingly feeling up the back of my neck here in that one, uh, Mark. That's, that's an unbelievable inspiration for, for how you, your philosophy as a coach has developed. Um, uh, me, uh, similar to Mark, I grew up in a very sporty household. Um, my, my kind of background in this space was just, doing, just coaching, did a degree in sports science, did a PhD in skill acquisition, lecturing in those two spaces right now in Cork Institute of Technology and, and University College Dublin. And I I suppose my my interest from a coaching perspective is I, I, for, I suppose in the last 10 years, I've done a lot of work in the elite athlete space. So it's kind of adult athletes who are, um, I suppose, maybe dependent on their skill set for, for their careers or their, their livelihoods and the like. Um, and suppose, as I said to you, Matthew, the, the idea of a practice coach for me is is because the work that I do with people is is to create, is to work with them where they practice. So my, I see my job as to um, create an environment where they practice that prepares them optimally for when they compete. Um, so I... Yeah, so I suppose there's a lot of sports psychological principles that underpin my work as far as from a feedback perspective and communication perspective, though I'm, I'm not a sports psych, uh, traditional in, in, that, in that space, but I have an appreciation of that work in, to have a, a, you know, a, a capacity to connect with the athletes. But ultimately, my job is, as someone said to me recently, it's like a, an environment architect. I, I'm, I'm constantly looking to have an impact on the environment 
they train it so that practice in so that it it equally has a knock on effect on the environment that they compete in. Wow. Now that's that that I think you did a pretty good job following Mark there. That was that's that's really cool. And I think it's it's right in line with what we're trying to do. You know, that's we're all about practice. Um and fortunately with, with Ian we can introduce the psychological element. As you said, there's a lot of that that goes that's involved in it. Um, so this is going to be a, a really interesting conversation. I think Mark's got a bunch of questions, and I, and I have a few questions, obviously. So, um, Mark, I'm going to go first. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I could sense that. <laughs> um, it's, it's your podcast. You can do whatever you like. <laughs> so, uh, Ed, I, I'm obviously really interested in the acquisition of skill, the, the, the learning of, of being able to do something good. And I, I have tried to spend a lot of time with people in motor learning. Um, and, you know, I think what you talk about and what you say and, and do is fascinating. So I would really like to get from you your, your sort of take on what skill acquisition is to begin with if we just start off there by telling people and explaining to people what it actually is yeah and i think for me skill acquisition is not an end point and for me skill acquisition is is the capacity to acquire a skill that's adaptable um i think i've yet to come across an athletic space where there are repeated stimuli that are the exact same time and time again Um, and yet the skills that are used look quite similar but they are subtly different in in many different ways so for me skill acquisition is is the starting point essentially you've got to acquire the skill and that is that, that enables you to get at least get to have a seat at the table and then and then how you work on that skill and practice that skill, it needs to feed into the adaptability of that skill so that it can, and, and the athlete can select accordingly for what's in front of them. So that, that would be for me a sum up. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. It's a, a lot about the environment uh, that you're trying to create for the player. So what, what are, Within the golf space, what what are some common myths that that you find are associated with with skill acquisition and and trying to develop skill? Yeah, it's an issue one because I, I, I you know I suppose I'm I'm relatively new to golf as a practitioner. I've been around golf all my life, but as as far as working in the space as a as a coach, as a you know someone who's been hired to work with clients. That's only in the last couple of years uh, because I would, I've come from a lot of, of other sports. Um, and so it's been really nice to kind of, for me, for someone who's been around golf forever and, and now to be coming in and looking at it with a very different lens, I'm very aware of, of the things that you've asked there. And I think one of the big things from a skill acquisition point of view is is there's, there tends to be, and it depends on the level that we're talking about and, some, and, and also maybe the experience of the coaches too because there's some exceptional, exceptional minds out there already, but there are some also um, quite resilient um, old school beliefs as well. And, and they would be things like the, the, the chasing and the, the hunt for the perfect swing. Um, and and the, the manner in which you do that is by massive and massive amounts of of reps um that's 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 something that that i think is still um a big part of 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 the game for some people um i think the 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 other the other side of it is maybe the the lack of connectedness between the practice environment and the and the plane the 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 competitive environment that's something that is is still it still needs a lot of work in my in my estimation um again there are of course there's some people out there who, who who are doing a great job in that space but but the overarching feeling i think in the industry and in the in this in the game is 
is those two things are, are they're not aligned strongly enough for, for what I believe to be an optimal space for transfer to exist. Um, I suppose they'd be the two main ones. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, very much along the same lines, we, we tend to find the practice environment isn't really replicating uh, or simulating any, in, in any way for the most part what the competitive environment, you know, demands. So, yeah, I'm, I'm right on point there with you. Mark? Yes. You still here? I'm still here. I was listening, enjoying yeah, the right. inputs from it. So do you want to do you want to follow on after that, Mark? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I, I do have some. Uh, I mean, the the thing Ed touched on there with the perfect swing, and that's that's the issues we are we are having here as well. Because I, I think the coaches owe to the kids to uh, actually look a bit of are we doing the right thing here. Is it the best way we do the stuff? But there is another side as well that they have to explain what they're doing for the parents on the side. Uh, and I do see that issue, and I understand that that is sometimes a challenge. That maybe they are not willing to to take that up because that that's not really an easy challenge to to uh, to go through with. Uh, it's quite quite tough to to explain. Um, but there is, there is an obsessive, obsessive drive towards the ecstatic, pleasing uh, swing. Um, but Ed, I, have, I have a question. The, the, the skill acquisition part, how, how, yes. how much do you find it connected to the, to the mindset of the junior? Um, my experience is that I, I think a lot of coaches, they jump to the, to the learning part very fast. Like they ha they want to teach a skill, but uh, in in my world there there is a step before that in, in order to to make the the junior ready to actually uh, learn from you. Um, how what what's your take on that? I uh, yeah I, I would agree with that. I think that's actually a really really good point. I think we very often with with juniors we rush them to learning as opposed yeah. to getting. I've a real, I've a real joy in one sense of taking, taking my time with junior athletes so that to give them every opportunity themselves to learn how to learn, because yeah. I think uh, it's really cha it's it's a much more challenging space to be in working with a senior athlete, an adult athlete, who has been spoon fed that 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 learning experience. So mm -hmm. they are. They're merely passengers in their own journey. They have yeah. very little autonomy, and they have very little um, room for decision making and problem solving because it's it's a very it's in a very prescribed space. So I would completely agree with that. If, if with junior athletes, it's I, I absolutely want to resi resist even more the temptation to get them to learn <laughs> something um, yeah. and. And in and in the hope that I'd actually be going into that kind of space, saying, "Well, my my job here is just to measure: are they learning how to learn? Are they mm. actually are the tools that they're developing tools that are actually going to make me redundant in my current form with them? And it's going to encourage mm. and force me to actually develop myself while I'm coaching them." Yeah, uh, yeah I think I that's. Because one, one, one of my questions was actually how how, how we develop juniors into uh, becoming great learners. Yeah, and I think and I think that for me that's it. For me, that is by setting them up very 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 early on, as, as from from the very first session, that they themselves are v really capable young people, capable of great problem solving, yeah. and. For for them to to get a real boost from the from the environment that you create around them that hey we're 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 all, we're all in here and we're on the same page you should not look at me as someone who's who's uh, knows more because I'm older because you know what for where you're at and for the lens you look at life through I know nothing so my my job is to try and 
just create a space where it, it matches the lens you're looking through right now so that it can be one of huge fulfillment of your capacity, but also huge space for you to just figure stuff out for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If, if you think about the world they're living in outside the golf course when they're yeah. not with you. Now, yeah. I, I have a daughter in the first grade and right. they are talking about the weekdays and the month and every single morning she's asking, what day is it today? <laughs> yeah. Because they are asked about it in school. And yeah. I say, what day was it yesterday? It was Tuesday. So what day do you think it is today? <laughs> and she, she, she doesn't really know. But she, And then there comes the sentence that catch my, my ears. There was, but I really don't want to make a mistake in school. So that, yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the school system, that they're counting the mistakes. And the less mistakes they have, the better you are. And that's, that's just not a very good, how do you call that, combination with the, yeah. in learning how to play golf. I, I'll tell you that that's so uh, that's incredible how uh, similar that is to something that happened with my my six year old boy recently. He asked me. He said, "Dad, why do I need to know the time?" And I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Why do I need to know the time? Surely, surely I, I just I just do what I want to do. Uh, if I'm tired, I go to bed. And if I'm not, I don't. why do I need to go? Why do I need to know the time?" And I was like, "He's so he's so he's so right, you know." Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> what? The, well, you don't need to know the time. Just if you're tired, go to bed. If you're not, stay up. If you want to do this, go do that. <laughs> That's amazing. Essentially, and and, we, and the, the conversation went on for a bit because I was I was I was I was like I'm going down this rabbit hole with you. I can't wait to see where this goes. But it was all about <laughs> sure. You know, if I want, if I'm hungry, that I I I'll, I'll eat now. And and you know, the classic parent thing is. He, you know, hungry 20 minutes before dinner. No, no, wait for dinner. But if I'm hungry now, why can't I eat now? Why, why wait for 20 minutes? If I'm hungry now, why can't, you know? And he was like, why why is time such a big deal, you know? Because he sees, <laughs> you know, I've got a watch on and there's a, and there's a clock on the wall. And he's like, he, he's all of a sudden realized, jeepers, we're all of us on about time. And we've got to leave for school at this time. We've got to. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. It was. It, was like, it, it, it almost kind of, you know, when we finished the chat, he, he, he moved on and probably had forgotten about it a few minutes later. And yet I was, I was like still two hours later thinking, oh, my God, he's blown my mind. Here. <laughs> it was so cool. Uh, Ed, so what, um, uh, based off of what uh, Mark was just asking and what you, what you guys were just talking about, I'm, I'm really interested to know what, what does coaching practice look like for you? I know everybody is an individual and everyone's so unique that it's different for everybody, but there's got to be some sort of maybe principles that, that you follow or some sort of system uh, that, that you, that you kind of have in mind or things that you look for, things that you want to see, things that you don't want to see. What I'm really, if you, if you go into a golfer's, space right now or a golf coach asks you to get involved with a golfer what does coaching practice look like for that yeah that's that's a great question um I can, if i can jump in there first the the, the i think the this the big thing for me and i you're right you you you'll, you'll have some principles just to to kind of set the scene a little bit for yourself in your own in your own headspace and i think very often that scene is set for me by the strength of the questions I can pose into into the space, um, and I a couple of mates of mine in the states, Sean Mishka and Ross Cooper, they 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 sent down a, a quote that they kind of came up with one day after they were had a bit of a brainstorming, and, and it's something that stayed with me all these months later. And it's the 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 question is the answer, the problem is the solution, and when I think about that. And it stayed with me. And I remember when they first sent it on to me, they're like, Ed, what do you think of this? We, we just kind of happened upon this. I was like, oh, wow. And I sent back to one of that, you know, that emoji with the, when the head is blown off the top of the, the, the emoji, you know? Mm -hmm. I was like, that's that's it for me. Because that was that quote encapsulated it perfectly what I was trying to articulate with my own head, which is rather than giving the answer, ask such a good question that if they answer that, well, that, that is the answer. And, and rather than thinking of, you know, providing some, the solution, well, come up with a good enough problem 
and this is aligning with the good challenge point theory and all the good kind of that, that space, come up with a good problem so that the solution that they come up with is exactly the, the is the exact solution to take you in the right direction. And I, that's something that is, it, that's a good, that's a good uh, sp space for me to begin with, with an athlete. Um, because then it just means that uh, if, if, if it forces me, me away from my tendency to over talk. Um, and, and, and I, and I, and I, and I talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of us could talk <laughs> a lot, right? Especially golf coaches. Yeah. So, but so, so that's that, that's a key thing for me, though, is just to just to create enough good questions, ask enough good questions, and create enough good problems um, in those early sessions, and then from there, it's something that I was asked recently about. You know, do, is there any kind of system I look to? And I said, well. Not so much a system, but I, I kind of came about a, a way, and I, it's the kind of I, I call it the peak model, the P E A Q model, and it's and the the P is for praise because I I I think there's not enough praise for athletes, and it's not empty praise. It's praise when they do something well, and 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 when they don't, it's it's silent. It's to allow them, it's to allow them to reflect on something and and let them think about it and not provide feedback. But just you know, but if they do something well, well, boost them with praise. The E is for exploration. Let them explore. Give them time to just play around with some ideas. Figure out a constraint that you've put in front of them. The A is for affirmation, and I use that quite a lot. Is to when when I praise, I actually link it to something important. So that's a great pass. I really like the way you you held on to it for that last that split second before you released it so that you're affirming it you're linking the praise to to something they've done well and then the last part the q is is to question to really work hard on myself to communicate through questions rather than answers and solutions that's incredible peak p e a q q uh, i have a question to uh, to that yeah um the praise part. What, what kind of praise is it? Is it towards effort or what they put into it? Or yeah, it, it's it, it's it's a lot of my praise is around the the, the process. That, so yeah. either that's the the effort, it's that it's their application, it's their it's their capacity to um, remain you know focused when when it's not going well. Um, because again, I think w one of the things I, when I've started really putting a lot of time and effort into developing better practice environments, I began to realize there's a huge amount of failure in that space. So that, that, I, I, that forced me to think of, of, I suppose, more appealing ways for athletes to want to engage in it, but, and also engage with me because the vast majority of their practice does not have as much failure as mine does because it's a lovely uh, you know, rose, rosy in the garden practice effect <laughs> they're getting. Whereas, whereas the guys generally practice with me, it's, it, it's, it's, it's tough from the very first shot and it's, mm. and the very first kick and the, the very first basket. It's, it's tough from, from the very first one so that, the, 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 even the skill of just being able to switch on and get ready when you're when you need to be ready is also something that's practiced and and you don't ease yourself into the session because you don't want to ease yourself into the round or be two over after three holes and all of a sudden you're chasing the field wow. uh, so that I, I guess from that perspective Ed, you would be, um, you know, if we look at challenge point, for example, you'd be on the more challenging side <laughs> of the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I would. And I love, I love Mark Guarnoli's, uh, Guarnoli's work. I really do. And in fact, uh, and, it, and the, the, the trick is, and, and the tricky part is to find out what where that challenge point is, you know, that task difficulty that is matching to where they are just, just out, just out of reach, you know. It's so that it really requires their full capacities to be 
switched on to be able to engage. And and even even my warm up, I spoke with Cordy Walker there recently, and, and he was just we were just chatting about warm ups. You know, what do you do in your warm up? And I said, well. There's 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 some really you know the warm up is hugely individual and, and it's personal, but but it should also have a purpose, and it should not be it should not be just a, a going through the motions. It's it's ready you for competition to be super fresh on the first tee box, and if if there's anything in there that's taking you away from that, well, why is it in there? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that's an interesting one. I, I see a lot of that in junior golf. But I, I, when I say I see a lot of that, what I, more specifically, I see a lot of wasted energy. I see a lot of wasted time, a lot of really, like you said, just going through the motions. But then I, I've also seen it. I've seen it at, at the highest level as well. I've, I've been to practice rounds and I've been to the, um, uh, the tournament rounds for PGA Tour events, and I've been on the range beforehand, you know, walking up and down and, and seeing what some of these guys are doing. And I'm, I try not to be um, hypercritical or, or judgmental in a way, but it seems on the surface level that some of the things, and I could be completely wrong, but it seems on the surface level that some of the things these guys are doing is a waste of time. Um, yeah. So, well, do you know what? That's an interesting point. That's an interesting point, Matthew, because um, especially in this last season, I, I, I was at quite a few events. And uh, it, it's, it's interesting having spoken to a few coaches. And, and again, you're at an event and all of a sudden you, you kind of see someone you kind of recognize. You've never met them, but you kind of recognize them kind of thing. And you, you're going to go up and say, hi, are you? You yeah. know, I really, like, I really like your work. And <laughs> you I'm Ed, I'm not stalking you. I haven't traveled all the way from Ireland just to see you. Kind of <laughs> but, but it's interesting when, when you actually get talking to these coaches, and these are these are serious swing coaches and serious guys in the in the space. The, and you start you start asking them and say, Gene, you know, you know, I just saw you working with the, that guy there. And 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 again, like that, you know, you, your first thing would be, what is going on there? You know, and then you start talking to them, and it's like, yeah, it's really hard. I'm trying to get him out of that. You know, I so even imagine, such yeah. the coaches themselves, they're they're in that space of because maybe they, they themselves are finding this a, a new way, a better way, because we're all interested in getting better, let's say. But they also they're in that space of, well, I've got to try and move them from one place to another place. And that's that's not a rip the plaster off thing. No. That's a, slowly, and, and it's interesting, you're having a chat with someone and. And you're like, oh, hi, geez, great to meet you. How are you? And what are you doing here? He said, I oh, know I'm just here this week because I'm, I'm trying really slowly and, you know, but deliberately to move this guy away from just banging ball after at an event. And he, and he mm -hmm. said, literally, I'm, I'm here this week. And all I'm going to do is just to make sure he doesn't go to the range after his round. Because that's what he just, <laughs> whether, he's playing, whether he's not, he just feels like I've got to go and I hit another 100 balls after being on the course for five hours, you know. So that's, as you said, like it's 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 yeah. the, it's only when you start asking questions and talking to you guys, you realize that they're all out there trying to solve as well. They're all out there trying to <laughs> change behaviors of guys, you know, who mm. who you know will have gotten into some bad habits over the years. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Mark, do you before we before we wrap up, Mark, do you, do you have any any final question, a final question, or anything you you want to? Yeah, I do. I, I do have, but I, I think we the thing we you just talked about as well. We see that at, at club level as well, and I think the grown-ups or the the players that have been in the game for a long time, they're just fixed in the old way of of doing the stuff, and that was repetition, uh, and a lot of them. Uh, and the, the the thing we have with with our juniors is. It doesn't matter when I stop their practice and ask them why, they have to be able to explain me why they're doing what they're doing. And that's, that's we do that from six years old. It's, it's a different reason they come with, but they, they need to have a why. They need to grow up with thinking, I want to learn this, so I'm doing this. Maybe it's not the right thing, but it, it doesn't really matter. They, they thought about what they should do to, to get what they wanted. Yeah. Um, and there was an example for uh, from today actually. Uh, one guy came and 
I really want to learn that shot Magnus is doing. Uh, okay, okay, that's that's perfect. Show me. And he said, but I cannot do the shot. And I said, no, no, no. You, you misunderstand me. You you said you want to learn that shot. You have to show me that. And then he started to get it. And I just wanted him to sh- to show me how uh, that he actually wanted to learn. And then we got a conversation started on. If uh, I said to him, if, if I wanted to, to learn the, to play the guitar, how would I look? What would I do uh, right now in order to learn that? And you would sit and practice and uh, I said, what if it's difficult? Would I just go and ask for the answer or would I try more? I think you would try more. Okay, you have 10 minutes to show me that you want to learn that shot. And then that's the first step on the journey. Um, okay, okay, and that, that made sense. So if, every... Every session we have, or every new thing they want to learn, I want them to to get a, a you can call it a life skill with them. It's, it's, in my world, it's not enough just to teach them a shot, because if we have to face it, they are probably going to do something else than golf when they're grown ups. So yeah. we that's we want them to have something else. That's a um, brilliant point. I think that's one thing. If you, if you were to ask me, what is the lowest hanging fruit? In world sport, you read my mind, Dad. You read my mind. I was going to ask. To me, for me, it's reflective practice. Yeah. I it's... the lowest the amount of guys who have not developed the skill of knowing how to reflect on their work and finding the reason why, and yeah. and 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 it is like they they think oh it's just to think about it no no no. There's a there's a skill. Look at the work of Barry Zimmerman. Look at there's a skill to eking out every ounce from every session, so then that you can actually park it when you're not doing it because you're not having to think about it because you you've reflected on it and you can then move on to doing a social activity and catch up with friends and family and getting balance into your life because it won't it won't stay with you if if you're able to get stuck into the why, realize what it was, what it wasn't, what you'd like it to be the next time, and then you'll get to it the next time because you'll have something to work on. I, I'm that's that's the, probably the big, the fastest um, space that I can get some improvements with with an athlete, and it's hilarious. It's nothing to do with in their practice space. It's just teaching them how to reflect better, yeah. and yeah. so few people. Do it number one, and then when they do it, do it well enough for it to actually impact on performance. Mm. Yeah, that's that's what that's what has shocked me as well. The last uh, I I told you the story Ed, about the the young squad I have yeah. here in the in, in in the golf club, and and uh, I will try to make it short, Matthew. But I think it's very important in this in this area um, when we talked about these things, and we. We had a group of young golfers that were the upcoming elite players in a few years, and uh, I looked at the group for three years ago when I when I took over, and it was a group of good kids, but they were very afraid of challenges and failing, and if they had the choice, they would always choose the easy way, just in order to succeed, and if if they didn't succeed, they would try to somehow drag the other teammates, if you can call that word, with them down. And, and I, I said to myself, if, if, they need, if they're going to have a chance in this game, we have to change this. They, they don't have to become better in the golf shots because they are good already. But they, we have to change everything other than the golf, actually, in, in their mind. So I, I try to create our own world here in the golf club where uh, we are actually selecting the, the juniors for the team by their personal traits. And in that I mean if they are brave, uh, if they are creative, if they are show resilience, if they are a good body, if they give compliments to the other guys on the team. And then we were rating them. And, uh, and some with high handicap came on the team before the ones with low handicap. And uh, we never talked about results. We just talked about this menu of, of yeah, personal traits you should have in order to, to get your success. And we did that for a couple of years. And they were playing uh, in yeah, it's, yeah, National League uh, against some grown-ups. 
last year they, they really got their ass kicked, but they were happy afterwards and they were reflecting, as we, we talked about, in a very grown up way. Uh, and this year they were actually number one in the league. Wow. And for some reason, uh, the day before the last final uh, match, we, uh, we actually needed one more player. We were one player short. And they, have, they had one choice or two choices. They could choose me to play with them uh, on the team or they could choose one of their bodies with a handicap of, I think, 15 or 16. Um, so the, the obvious choice, uh, short term, would, would be to choose me. So they maybe had a, a chance to win the league. And I said, this is your project. I'm not going to choose. I'm going to support you where, whatever you choose. But you, you know, you qualified for this team because of these, this menu of trades. I didn't do them this, this year, so I actually didn't qualify. I will play with you if you want me to play. But there's one guy that did it, and that's, that's Oscar. Uh, but the choice is yours, and you have a couple of minutes to make the choice. And they discussed. And they, I came back in, and they said, uh, we want to stay true to our project and our values, so we're going to choose Oscar. And I said, that's perfect. That's perfect. I'm going to get Oscar, and you're going to explain him and ask him if he wants to play with you tomorrow and explain him why. And they did that. And there was just uh, there was the same group of kids that for two years ago wanted to drag each other down and choose the easy way to get a success. And now they actually chose the hardest possible way. And they actually knew they would probably lose the league. Um, so that was a very big aha moment for me as a coach. And meanwhile, alongside with this project, if you can call it that, their performance just yeah, skyrocketed yeah. Uh, without actually focusing especially on that. Um, so I think that would be my point for coaches working with juniors that they really have to dig into this. I, and, I, remember, uh, I remember when you when you told me that story first, Mark, it, it really struck part of me about what you were saying, just having almost as a me as a metric for performances, how brave yeah. are you? If yeah. we can have that with you, with junior athletes, that that they want to be brave, they want to go out and express themselves as a junior. That's, that's a method. That's a method for 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 taking the the shackles off young people and allowing them to be creative, mm -hmm. rather than them feeling that they've got to mind themselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's and I think, and the the important thing is that they actually chose those traits. I asked, what do you think Jordan Spieth has besides very good golf shots? And they came up with these things. And then we afterwards define them together. And I think that's that's a key thing for them to take ownership of of this actually quite big challenge they had to. I think what you've done, Mark, I think I think what you've done is really just really worked on the, the person and the golfers yeah. come second. And we've talked about that a lot in the past. I think that, yeah. that, that story is incredible and it just shows for how how good of a coach you you are and and how much you believe in this and the results have been a byproduct of of this you know it, it, you almost you you talk really about psychological characteristics of excellence really you just help you're just helping these youngsters be a human being like a good human being and and the the golf the golfer comes after i think that's incredible a great story for us to uh, to end on um <laughs> Really, it, re it really is. Um, thanks, both of you guys, for coming on the show. Uh, if we could uh, let our audience know where they could potentially reach out to the, for, to the two of you, if they have any questions on particular topics, um, if you have both website, Twitter, Facebook, if you want to just go ahead and let everybody know what it is before we wrap up. Okay. Do you go first, Ed? Yeah, I um, yeah, I, I've a pretty similar handle across it all. I, I'm on Twitter at Dr. Skilak. Um, I'm Dr. Skilak at gmail.com and is my email and have a website uh, www.drskilak.com. So I'm more than happy to engage with people. I, I, I love the chats. Um, it always it, it always comes back to, to challenge my philosophy, and every day that happens is a good day. So happy to hear from people. Perfect. I will I will take over. Uh, my Twitter handle is uh, at Moland underscore Mark. 
and uh, yeah, my email is molen uh, dot uh, golf at gmail. Uh, and everything, every question is uh, is welcome. And I think the most important thing for us coaches is to share and just take time to develop each other and put ourselves out there and receive feedback and be open. Yeah. So I look forward for for any question. Awesome. And you know, guys, we'll put. We'll put your details that you just said. We'll put it in the in the blog article. We'll put it in the description of the podcast and all sorts of things like that. So if uh, people write it down wrong, which I probably would do, uh, at least they can all find it in the descriptions. Um, but thanks a lot, guys. Uh, peak, praise, explore, affirmation and questions. The question is the answer. The problem is the solution, I think, are the two biggest things other than that story, Mark, that you told at the end that have stuck with me through this podcast. But thanks a lot, guys. This is awesome. (laughs) All right. Well, I'm excited that I got to speak to the two of you together. I'm really pumped about getting this podcast out there to to all of our community. I think it's going to be pretty awesome. Um, So for everybody watching or listening, You can keep up to date with us. You can subscribe to our mailing list on gltgolf.com forward slash podcast radio show season two. Uh, You can follow us on SoundCloud or most of the social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, We have YouTube. This is obviously being recorded for YouTube. Uh, We're not there with Snapchat and I'm not sure when we will be, but I appreciate all your time. See you next time.